From all of us here at SEC Unfiltered, Chris, Dave, Harrison, myself, countless others working behind the scenes. Happy 4th of July, you SEC Unfiltered fanatics. Welcome on into the program. Thank you for joining us on America's Birthday, because there's nothing more patriotic than talking SEC football. I know you got a busy day ahead. You got to be watching the Glizzy Gobble contest without Joey Chestnut, which just seems completely un-American. You got to make sure that you're man in the grill. Got to get the burgers, the brats, the dogs, all ready for the fun festivities. You got to party like it's 1776. But if you do so, please remember to drink responsibly. And also, it leads up to the culmination of the night sky being lit up fireworks and i figured you know what what's better than fireworks fiery predictions going into the sec season so these are my 10 bold predictions going into a brand new era of college football real quickly welcome on into the channel make sure that you hit subscribe because it's only american if you watch this program every single day download the podcast version of the show because that's also patriotic leave a five-star review because if you want to party with us Leave a one-star review if you are a British colonizer, so we know that you don't want to do that. Make sure that also that you're following us on all the social media channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered. It's only American if you follow me on Twitter. I'm wearing a shirt that's partying. Uh, You want to party, it's at Mr. Cole Thompson. And if you want to keep up with the number one content surrounding your favorite squad, visit secunfiltered.com. Real quickly, this episode is brought to you by Rowback. Use promo code SECU for 20% off all joggers, polos, hoodies, shorts, much, much more. Use promo code SECU at Rowback.com. 10 bold patriotic predictions for 2024. I am an American. I am a proud American. And I am proud to say that these predictions are bold. They're kind of out of left field. More importantly, if I'm wrong on these, just remember, these were the boldest that I could come up with. And uh, also, if I'm right on these, uh, I was right. So that's how we're going to do this. Let's start off with number one, 16 from the SEC. Go to the college football playoff in 2024. Now, it seems a little far-fetched that 16s were getting in. I did a video earlier this year talking about what is the right number, five teams. However, with cannibalization at the top, which we'll get to in a little bit and in another video, you have to realize that the SEC is going to demand dominance. They want the most representation. And is it unfair to the Big Ten? Maybe. Is it unfair to the group of five and the ACC and the Big 12? Yeah, maybe. But let's just say you have six teams sitting at 10-2, and 11-1, and 12-0. And they all beat up on each other at the very get-go. You really going to count them out? You're really going to say that an Alabama squad that went 11 and one with its only loss coming to, I don't know, Georgia doesn't belong in the playoff because Georgia lost to Texas. You're really going to say that Texas loses to Texas A&M, but they beat up on everybody else that they're not belonging in the playoff. You're out of your mind. So I think right now, six teams will get in the playoff. My prediction is as of this moment, four teams guaranteed. I am putting in Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, And then I think that you will mix in a combination of one of these four, or two of these four, my apologies. Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee, LSU. Six of those squads are getting into the postseason. They will be a part of the dozen dance. Prediction number two, I believe that Missouri, not Texas, will lead the SEC in rushing yards. Cody Schrader may be off to the NFL, but his story, his impact in Columbia will never be forgotten. The man walked on from Truman State because he wanted to be a Tiger. He wanted to live up to Truman, the Tiger's name, and he ended up balling out. He led the SEC last year in rushing yards. He was phenomenal after contact, and he was a big reason why Eli Drinkowitz's offense was able to take new heights with Kirby Moore. But you got to find a replacement. Here's the difference between last season and this season. Nobody knew who Cody Schrader was. Many people know who Nate Noel and Marcus Carroll are. Nate Noel was coming on over from Appalachian State. He missed a few games over the last few years, but he did average 4.5 yards per play, and he also rushed for over 800 yards for the Mountaineers. We can talk about Marcus Carroll. This was a top 10 running back in college football last year. And I mean, he was a top 10 running back yards after contact, yards per rush attempt, rushing touchdowns, complete total yards, carries. He is a bowling ball of a runner. He is a bruiser. He will make defenders miss in the open field. He's got home run speed. He can do a little bit of everything. And now you're throwing that into an offense headlined by Brady Cook, Theo Weiss, and Luther Burden, arguably one of the best trifectas that we've seen since the Holy Trinity 
That, my friends, is a recipe for disaster at Faroque Field on Saturdays. Make no mistake, C.J. Baxter, you also throw in Jaden Blue at Texas. They're a good duo. Whoever you're going to have toting the rock down in Oxford, Mississippi, it's a pretty good duo. You can talk about what you got at Georgia. You can talk about what you have at Alabama, headlined by Justice Haynes. But at the end of the day, I think that the Tigers trump everybody, and they show their way to not only a college football playoff berth, but also definitely number one in yards, rushing attempts, and rushing touchdowns. Number three, Arch Manning will start one game for Texas in 2024. And let's go even bolder. One game in conference play. Now, a lot of people are going to say that this is a sign that Texas is turning the keys over to the nephew of Peyton and Eli. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I am going off of is Quinn Ewers has an injury history. Back-to-back years, he was the starting quarterback at Texas. In Big 12 play, he suffered an injury that sidelined him for at least two games. Happened in 2022 against Alabama. Then, of course, happened last year against Houston. So you know that there is an injury concern. The bodies are getting a little bit bigger. The bodies are getting a little bit more more massive. And more importantly, the pass rush is getting a little bit more potent. You might end up losing Quinn for a game or two. And it may be against a really good opponent. Could be against Florida. Could be against Texas A&M. In my opinion, regardless of whatever happens, maybe Quinn is a little bit beaten and bruised. I'm circling that Vanderbilt game. That game, I believe, is one where Arch will start. And the reason why is it wants to get his body acclimated to SEC play for when he takes over in 2024. That does not mean that there is a quarterback controversy. That does not mean that Manning is about ready to take off and we're going to say goodbye to Quinn Ewers. That does not mean that Ewers is going to be done and out of the count for the rest of the year. None of that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I believe that because Steve Sarkeesian knows offense and he also understands what the daily doses and what the battle and the bruises look like in the SEC. They're going to start Arch at least one game this upcoming year. I think they have to as well. It's not a death sentence. And if it's against Vanderbilt, I mean, what if Arch just throws for 375 yards? Quarterback controversy? No, but definitely a lot of optimism going into 2025. Number four, Josh Heupel finishes with a better record than the school that he played for but he ends up losing to them in the process. So I believe that right now, Tennessee is well-equipped to be on a run this year. They have Nico Iamaliava, the quarterback destined to fit in Hypo's go-go nonstop up-tempo attack. I believe that they have great wide receivers. Mikey Matthews is not getting talked about enough. Yeah, I love Perry Thompson. Yeah, I love Cam Coleman. Yeah, I love Ryan Williams. Guys, Mikey Matthews is going to be a stud in the volunteer country. That man is going to light up Neyland Stadium more so than when they, they, they do the flying team. It's going to be great. They also have Chris Brazel. They have Bruce McCoy. They have Squirrel White. They have a better defense. They have arguably the best defensive player in the conference in James Pierce. But I just feel like sometimes you have someone's number. And in my opinion, if this game is being played at Neyland Stadium in front of Rocky Top with 110,000 screaming fans, both inside the stadium and outside the stadium as it carries up and doesn't go out, So the sound ricochets off the walls, that leans in favor of Tennessee. But I do believe that at this point, Bill Beatonbow will have the offense well-equipped on the trenches. They will be able to hold their own long enough for Jackson Arnold to find one of three vertical threats down the field. Deion Burks, Andrew Anthony. You can also throw in Nick Anderson. They have a good rushing attack, and they got a top-20 defense that's ready to terrorize the conference. It's not a good Big 12 defense. It's a good defense, period. And Brett Venables knows what he's doing up in Norman. It feels like that while perhaps Tennessee maybe finishes with a better record than the Oklahoma Sooners in year one of this new conference, Oklahoma gets to boast out their chest and say, Hypel, head on back to Knoxville with an L and your and your tail tucked between your legs. Number five, the Lone Star Showdown will be the most watched game in conference play in 2024. So, yeah, I get it. The Iron Bowl is a great game. LSU versus uh, Alabama is awesome. Third Saturday in October, you could throw in the world's largest uh, outdoor cocktail party. Definitely, Georgia Ole Miss is going to carry a lot of weight. The Red River Showdown, now part of the SEC, is going to be phenomenal. But this adds fire. You got to realize, ladies and gentlemen, that Texas fans right now are saying, we pity A&M fans. We pity 
those down at College Station. Oh, you've been here for over a decade, but you only have one double-digit win season. On top of that, you've never been to Atlanta. You never won a conference title. Oh, and we just stole your baseball coach because of we're Texas. We can do whatever the hell we want. And so they pity, pity A&M fans. But deep down inside, they know that if they were to lose to A&M in, week, in the last week of the season, that is going to be a nonstop conversation. And I know firsthand, Alabama grad, I remember 2012, running back home, seeing friends in College Station, and all the people that I didn't know and they didn't know me, but they knew I was an Alabama grad, they screamed, hey man, 29-24. And I heard that nonstop every single day that I visited any area of the town, any area when I was out in Northgate, Every bar I went to, they made sure that I heard it. A&M fans, they want you to hear it. They want you to know that they are here, they are loud, they are proud, and more importantly, they are ready to shut you up when it is time. And so when I look at this game, what the ambiance is, to finally have it back on our television screens for the first time since 2011, you know it's going to be a night kick. I can almost guarantee you right now, lock it in in permanent marker, 7 o'clock kick, if not later, that every eyeball in America that isn't tuned on to their rival matchup will be paying attention to this game. It will be the must-see spectacle in 2024. I promise you, it will be the most-watched game in the SEC. It might be the most-watched game in all of college football. Prediction number six, five teams finish with a record above 10-2, and two, which means you're either 10-2, and 11-1, or 12-0. I already kind of made that clear because of I think that there's no shot that you won't get into the college football playoff without a 10 and 2 record, especially this year. You got to realize that the college football playoff committee is kind of going in with a blind eye. They have no idea what is the correct pathway to pick the dozen teams to fight in the dance. Well, if you're 10 and 2, that kind of solves the problem. And this is where, again, Alabama and Georgia would get the benefit of the doubt because of who they are, what the branding is, and what they've done for the conference to hold its own in the last decade during the 12-team playoff. I, I mean, the 14-team playoff. I completely understand that. The problem is, is that if you want to guarantee that you have the highest representation, you got to get 10 wins. I believe that you will see at least five teams finish with 10 and 2 records, which also means that 11 and 1, there could be a team, and there could be a team at 12 and 0. So let's go back and rephrase this. Five teams in the SEC finish at 10-2. and two. Who are those five? Well, it could be Georgia and Texas. could be where Ole Miss ends up being 11-1 and the only loss comes to the Bulldogs. Maybe it comes to the Tigers and Baton Rouge. Maybe it comes in the Egg Bowl. Who knows? Maybe you see Alabama go on an epic run. Kalen DeBoer, he's recruiting like no one's business. Maybe he can coach that same way, and they're undefeated. Maybe they're 10-2 and two this year. Maybe LSU surprises people. Yeah, they didn't spend a lot of money on the defensive front, but they arguably got the biggest asset in Bo Davis to come on over. Maybe Texas ends up going 10-2. and two. Maybe Oklahoma shocks the world and finds their way to actually a double-digit win record. And now we have to change our entire opinion about Brand Venables, which we already should, but that's not the point. Five teams finished with 10-2 and two records in 2024. And that also means that potentially at least one is sitting at 11 and 1 or 12 and 0. Prediction number seven Billy Napier finishes below 500, but Scott Strickland holds out hope for one more year. So there's ways that I view this in different formats. Let's start off with the first one. If Billy Napier goes four and eight this year, five and seven this year, and they lose because of incompetence, fourth down miscommunication, they get out of field goal range. Fights occur on the football field, and they just look like they're a disaster running downhill into the stop sign, and it is going to be a chaotic fireball that nobody can stop. Yeah, that's a whole different story. Yeah, Billy Napier, you're out of a job. Best of luck. Go back to G5. But what if they're 5-7, and seven, and they're going into the fourth quarter, and they're down by 20, and they fight their way back, and they tie the game, and they lose on a game-winning field goal? Or they lose and they come all the way back and they're down by three and they miss the game winning field goal. And what if Graham Mertz shows you that he is competent, he is poised, the team actually has a good identity, they're well equipped to hold their own, but they just can't get over the hump. It's why every loss differs in college football. It's more importantly why you can't judge a book by its cover just like you can't judge a team by its record. Some teams that are sitting at 10-2 and two in the Big 12 or in the ACC would go 4-8 and eight with Florida's schedule. 
Some teams that would be with that schedule, Florida would go 11-1 with their team. So you can never judge a team based off of what they have to go through in the gauntlet throughout the regular season to punch their ticket into the playoff consistency. What I will say is I believe that this Florida roster is better than advertised on offense. Elijah Badger comes on in. You also add in Shamir DK. I think Trey Wilson is going to be a human highlight reel by the season's end. They got like five running backs that all are going to be studs behind Montreal Johnson. I think the defense is going to be better than advertised. You let go of Coach Chaos, but now you're kind of letting Austin Armstrong have a little bit more of a voice with Ron Roberts. So I do believe that this squad will be better than what their record says they are. And because of you are seeing the progression, plus also you don't want to lose DJ Lagway after one season, Florida will hold out hope that Billy Napier next year, with having some veteran talent, with having some up-and-comers, hopefully a good overall recruiting class, they hold out and they give him one more shot. Number eight, Sam Pittman announces his retirement mid-season thus avoiding the firing. So I believe that right now the writing is on the wall that if Sam Pittman drops an early game, maybe it comes to Texas A&M, maybe it comes to another program, who knows if it comes to Auburn, whatever it is, Sam Pittman's got to win a certain amount of games. Maybe it comes to UAB and that's where they decide this is not working. If they believe at this point that this squad still can be able to hold its own, at least to be competitive, I believe Sam Pittman announces by midseason. Let's just say they lose to, I don't know, LSU on October 19th. After the Mississippi State game, you find out Pittman's going to retire at the end of the year. It gives Hunter Juracek a chance to be able to start the process of looking for a next head coach. It allows some people on the staff to decide what they want to do, and it also gives them an opportunity to play one out for Pitt. They play for Pitt. Let him go out with one more bowl game. Let him go out with an opportunity to say, I put off the upset against Ole Miss, or I put off the upset against Mizzou, or I put off the upset against Texas. We were able to do this for our coach as he rides off into the sunset. He goes out on top. And again, everyone loves Pittman. Pittman is like everyone's favorite uncle that comes to the barbecue and tells great stories about the 1970s. That's what you love about Pitt. He gets to go out on his own terms. And they get to bring in the next head coach. One name that I am monitoring like crazy, Brett Lashley at SMU. How does his team translate over to the ACC? They're fresh off of winning an American Conference title. If they can be one of the best versions of the roster in the new conference, then I believe that you're going to see him make the trip over on over to Fayetteville. So just never say never with that one. Number nine, Jackson Dart wins the Heisman Trophy. But the other three representatives all come from the SEC. It's an all SEC big party in the Big Apple. I believe in Jackson Dart. I am high on Dart being the guy. I am high on Dart being the name. I am high on Dart being the perfect addition to any squad. And Ole Miss has been dying for a Heisman Trophy winner. They need one down in the Grove. This is a roster that is going into year three with a quarterback that understands the ins and outs, the intricates, the do's, the don'ts, the highs, the lows, everything about Lane Kiffin's offense. He ends up balling out this year. He ends up setting records. He ends up having a highlight moment in whatever game it is, Oklahoma, LSU, maybe it comes against Georgia. He gets the monumental win on the primetime stage, which is a big deal in college football. And he goes to New York City and he is crowned college football's finest. But He's going to have some competition. Now, maybe it's a wide receiver. Luther Burden, I promise you this. If Devonta Smith can go ahead and win the Heisman Trophy, you 100% can too, my friend. I absolutely believe Quinn Ewers can have an opportunity to make a name for himself now in the SEC. I believe you're going to see a sleeper. Maybe it's Connor Wegman down in College Station. Maybe it's Graham Mertz down in Gainesville. Who's to say? Whatever it is, I do believe you will have a sleeper. And then, of course, Carson Beck. Beck, I believe, is going to be as advertised. Consistently accurate, moving the sticks, finding a way to push the football down the field and put himself in a great situation. If I am a betting man right now, my four representatives for the college football's finest award, individual honor, Jackson Dart wins it, Carson Beck comes in second, Jalen Milrow from Alabama lives up to the hype in this new offense led by Kalen DeBoer, and I'm going to go really wild here and say Luther Burden finds his way as that wide receiver that we just saw last year with Marvin Harrison. And number 10, 
bold one of all. Not really that bold if you really think about it, because in the SEC, it just means more. It's an all SEC national title. Now, I'm not sure how this would go about, but here's what I do know. The SEC, I predict, has six teams going in. So let's just say it's Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, Mizzou, and I'm going to go ahead and just go bold and say it's LSU. I believe that they will make sure that it is 3v3 just to go through the gauntlet. Make sure that you are pushing your way. So, of course, Alabama or Georgia or Texas or whoever wins the SEC gets the bye. Then you have a matchup, a matchup, one away. They're going to make sure that they're built. But in the SEC, we know that right now their conference, they're going to be battle-tested. Any single one of them. Tennessee is going to be battle-tested. Oklahoma is going to be battle-tested. Missouri is going to be battle-tested. Uh, uh, definitely Texas is going to be battle-tested. Even Mizzou will be battle-tested. They will because they're going to still have to play Alabama. They find their way to beat up on Big Ten squads, Big 12 squads, AAC squads, ACC squads, Mountain West squads, and they punch their ticket to the semis. And in the semis, comes down to the wire. But lo and behold, in the dang place of the College Football Hall of Fame, with the National Championship resides this year, it will be Southern as all hell. Dr. Pepper himself could not even say that it is Southern enough. The SEC is represented down in Atlanta on both sides of the football field. And those are my 10 bold predictions. Happy 4th of July to all of you SEC fanatics. Make sure that you hit subscribe because it's only patriotic to make sure that you are a part of this channel. Make sure you download the podcast version of the show because it's American to listen to podcasts during SEC country days and America's birthday. Leave a five-star review if you love this type of content. One-star review if you hate this type of content. Download the podcast version of the show and also download us on social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered. And to keep up with the number one content surrounding your favorite squad, visit secunfiltered.com. I'm Cole Thompson. Happy birthday, America. Have fun. Drink responsibly. We'll see you all tomorrow. Later.